everlasting God. Come on, just give him a praise, give him a shout. God, you are the everlasting Father. I thank you, I adore you. God, you are so good. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. I will
losing my voice, and that's what I get for trying to sing, so uh, I, I, I know better, I know better, but I did it anyways, and so, so that means that today's message might be a bit shorter, so depending on how long my voice goes, someone's clapping, I heard someone clapping over there, <laughs> amen, <laughs> hurry up, <laughs> amen, but today I feel like I come with the word for all of us, amen. How many have come ready to hear a word of God today? Amen. amen. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 6, we can stand in honor of the word of God. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 6. Man, Brother Cameron, good to see you again, my brother. Love that man right there, amen. Psalm 8, 3 through 6. When I look at the sky... And I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place. What are mere mortals, or another translation would say, what is man, that you should think about them? Human beings, that you should care for them. You made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made putting all things under their authority and honor. The flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and everything that swims, the ocean currents. That's the list of what man has been given charge or authority over. And today I want to talk to us on this thought. Amen. Some of you will recognize this. You have Dominion. You have dominion. Amen. Amen. How many believe that today? Amen. We have dominion. Tenemos dominio. Lord, we come to you today grateful and thankful for this privilege that you've granted us to gather together in this sacred place. We ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. Prepare us, God, for what you want to say. Help us, God, to be ready to receive your word. Anoint our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, touch our minds to understand, and our hearts to hide your word so that when we leave this place, we can apply it to our lives and become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Pray for myself, God, help me to speak clearly. Touch my voice, God. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you have dominion. If you're online... Tap on, type on there, you have dominion. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You have dominion. This passage of scripture has been one of my favorite scriptures for a very, very long time. But I'll never forget a night where I was just, it was a clear, beautiful night. I, I stood outside of my house and I started gazing at the stars, gazing at the moon, gazing at the night sky, and I was marveled at the fact that it was so clear and so beautiful, and you could see the different forms of the stars, and you could you can see the glory and majesty of the sky. And I remember looking at that and thinking, "Wow, that is what God has created." I was so shocked at the fact that 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 this was so great and massive, and I began to think about how. Every star is like our sun, and, and, and I'm not saying that there are planets that are surrounding every star, but could you imagine the massiveness of each uh, solar system and the sizes of the stars and, and 
all the, the, the massive universe and to think that God created all of that. I was marveled at the fact that God in his goodness and his bigness created all this. And yet, in seeing all that God had created, all the wonder, all the marvel, I began to think about God even in the midst of all this bigness. You still care about me? Man, have you ever thought about that? The God that created the heavens and the earth, the God that created everything that exists, even if this world may seem big. Can you imagine how much bigger our universe is? And then to think of how great all that is and then to reflect and think, God, out of all the bigness in the world, you have chosen me. I remember and I remember thinking that and I thought about what David began to write in Psalm chapter 8. He said that he had made man a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. He said that God had given them charge of everything that God had made, putting all things under their authority. And so this really grasped me the other day when I was reading it. It really grabbed my heart, grabbed my attention, grabbed my face, and it caused me to take a look at this passage of scripture. He said that he had made man a little lower than God. In other words, man was created with greatness. You were created with greatness. You're not just anybody. You're not just someone insignificant. You're not just a throwaway person. But God has created you a little lower than himself. And then he goes on to say, and he gave them charge over everything. God made Putting, uh, made us to, ha- to, to have authority over everything that he created. I want us to understand something today. That the moment that you feel that you're insignificant, that you're worthless, that you have no value, that you're nothing. God didn't create junk. God created you to be a little lower than him. He created you to, because he has a purpose for your life. He created you because he sees value in you. But not only did he end by making you valuable, but he also gave you authority over everything he created. In other words, we have been given authority over everything that has been created. That's why at the end of the day, we can, man can tame wild animals, man can tame waters, man can tame many, many things in this world because God has given us authorities, given us charge over these things. So as we take a closer look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, the Bible says that God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the livestock, and all the wild animals in the world, and the small animals that are scurrying along. So God created human beings in his what? Own image. In the image of God, he created them, both male and female, he created them. So God decided, I'm going to make something new. I've created the earth. I've created the moon, the stars, the skies. I've separated light from darkness. I, I've done all these marvelous things. I made plants. I made vegetation. I made the waters come together and dry land appear. I put chaos in order. I've done all of this, but there's something missing. He said, I'm going to create a human being. He creates the human being. The Bible tells us he makes us in his own image, in the image of God where we created. And then he tells us that God blessed us as humans to be fruitful and multiply. I want you to know today that being fruitful and multiplying is not optional, but it's a law. It's a law that we live by. What do you mean, Pastor? What if, how do I become fruitful and multiply? Whatever, whatever you produce, you, it multiplies and, and it's fruitful. If you produce good fruit, guess what? You're going to produce uh, good fruit and you're going to multiply that. If you produce bad fruit, you're going to be fruitful and multiply that. So we're always going to be fruitful and we're always going to multiply. But it's determined by us whether we're going to be fruitful and multiply good things or bad things. So this is a law given by God saying we're going to be fruitful and multiply and then he gives the commandment to fill the earth 
and govern it. God had given us the human, as humans the charge to fill the earth and govern the earth. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the animals that scurry all along the ground. God made us in his likeness and in his image. God gave us authority to rule and to govern the earth. We, you and I, have been given charge to rule and govern the earth. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we must set up our own government and establish our own kingdom? I believe that yes, in a sense, we must. But at the same time, on the same token, I believe that God is wanting to show us something just a tad bit deeper. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. We as humans were made of the earth. Therefore, we are also to govern not just the earth, planet earth, but we are to learn to govern ourselves. I don't know if you caught that today. But you and I were formed out of the dust of the earth. And just as we are supposed to rule and reign over this earth, we are also to rule and reign over our selves. We are to govern ourselves. We are to make sure that we have ourselves in check. We have been given the power. Everybody say, we've given the power. We're given the power to govern ourselves. Even when times get tough, we can make good decisions. Man, thank you for a few of you believing that. Now, I know that it's one thing to say, I'm going to make good decisions when things get tough. But it's another thing to make good decisions when things get tough. But we are called and commanded by God not to wait till the time gets better, but we're commanded by God to rule and to govern the earth. You and I are made from the earth. We are to rule and to govern ourselves. God from the very beginning has given us dominion to have authority over the flesh. God has given us dominion to have authority over ourselves. God has given us the power and the commandment to do so. We cannot control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to what happens to us. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 2b and through 5, the Bible begins to tell us the story of a man by the name of Adam and Eve. They had been given charge over the Garden of Eden to take care of it, Yet they chose to disobey, and so they were kicked out of the garden. And as they were kicked out of the garden, the following chapter begins to tell us that they, they ended up having sons. They had two boys, Cain and Abel. And these two boys were, were, were the this offspring, the multiplication, the fruitfulness of this relationship between Adam and Eve. The Bible tells us in our reading, when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. And when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as the gift of the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the first lambs of his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but, the, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Here we see this story. Now we don't have very many details and you can assume all you want. Why did God accept one gift and not the other? Because God had accepted Abel's gift. He gave a lamb and yet the Bible doesn't give us details. It doesn't tell us why he, uh, why he accepted it, uh, uh, Abel's. Perhaps it was because it was a lamb. Perhaps it was because it was the best. Perhaps it was because of his motives and his attitude. And we see that Cain's gift was not accepted. All we can really conclude with is at the end of the day, because we don't have enough details, is the fact that the story isn't trying to tell us what we can and cannot sacrifice. But what it's telling us is how to respond when we're feeling rejection in our lives. And so this is a moment where Cain is rejected. His gift is rejected. 
What he offered unto God was rejected. And so this caused Cain to feel bad. Have you ever been rejected in life? Have you ever gone through rejection? Have you ever felt rejected? I don't know about you, but I have many times. I've gone through rejection time after time after time. I remember being promised raise after raise, position after position, told I was going to be able to move up in my company. And guess what? Someone else would come in and they would get the position. I would feel rejected. I would feel hurt. I would feel like, God, don't you care? God, why do they lie to me? God, why, God, why is this happening? But I, what, 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 what happened to me, I couldn't control. But what I could control was how how I responded to what happened to me. And so here Cain had an opportunity to make the right decision and give the right response. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, the Lord looks at him and says, Why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what's right. Now again, could it be that he's talking about the sacrifice? Or could it be that he's being told, if you do what's right going forward or your next move, you will be accepted. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. For sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. We have to understand that if we don't have our earth, our flesh, ourselves in check, Whatever comes our way, if we don't have this as we're, as we're ruling and governing it, then we're going to find ourselves being controlled by our circumstances. We're going to be controlled by what happens to us. We're going to be controlled by our surroundings and our environment. So God told him that you must subdue it and it must be mastered. In other words, what God is wanting us to understand is things are going to to happen in our lives that we have no control over but you and I have been given power authority charge and dominion to control how we respond to what happens how we respond to what happens to us and this is what God is wanting us to understand that we must learn to subdue and to master whatever we're facing whatever we're going through it might not feel good it might hurt I might not like it, but that doesn't matter. I can govern and rule and master myself and know that I can make it. Cain needed to learn to govern himself. But what did he do? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, one day Cain suggested to his brother, Hey, little bro, let's go out to the fields. So they went, and while they were out in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel. Now let me tell you again what I envision. Does anyone here have siblings? Have you, have you ever gotten a fight with your sibling when you were younger? Hopefully not now. <laughs> Hopefully we, we matured out of that, right? I hope so. If not, this could be you. And so they go out, and they're out in the fields, and so, 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 so Cain is wanting just to whoop on his brother. Just, I'm going to teach him. This is what he gets for, for, for one-upping me. This is what he gets for, for trying to show off to God. This is what he gets for, for, for getting God's favor and me being rejected. And the Bible tells us that he attacked his brother. It doesn't tell us that he premeditated murder, but rather in his attack of his brother while he's beating up his brother, his brother dies. Can you imagine what Cain was feeling? God gave him an opportunity and he said, why are you so down? If you do what's right, you will be accepted. You must learn to subdue and master yourself. If not, sin is crouching at the door. And when we don't learn to govern ourselves and we allow whatever emotion or thing that we're facing control us, it'll take us farther beyond what we intended to do. It really will. It really will. Have you ever been upset at your spouse 
And you just want to give them a piece of your mind and you end up saying something that's so much more hurtful than you intended to say. Or to your kids. Or kids to your parents. Because we go beyond what we think we're going to say because we don't learn to control ourselves. Yes, be angry, the Bible says, but what? Sin not. And so the Cain didn't understand what God was telling him. God was telling him, controlate, control yourself, take, 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 take control of your emotions, subdue what you're feeling and master yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to do something you're going to regret. It would have been one thing to leave his brother there bloody and hurt and messed up, but he would have gotten washed up and he would have gotten up and he would have gotten better and eventually they would have made up. But no, that's not what happened. He killed his brother by accident and sin and because of his not willing to control himself, rule and govern himself, he destroyed his brother for life. Cain could not control what happened to him. He couldn't control the fact that God was going to reject his offering, but he had the ability to control and subdue his anger. He had been given the power to From the very beginning of creation, he was given the power to. God reminded him that he was given the power to control his anger. He had been given the power to do it, yet he chose not to do it. And it cost him the life of his brother. Who are you destroying because you fail to govern yourself? I want that to sit in your mind for a moment. What relationship are you destroying because you refuse to govern yourself? What opportunities are you destroying because you refuse to govern yourself? What doors are shutting because you refuse to govern yourself? God has called us to govern and reign the earth. In contrast, we see another young man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph, again, could not control his environment. Joseph happened to be the firstborn of his father, of his father, in the sense that though he wasn't the firstborn, he was the firstborn in the relationship between his father and the father's love of his life. And so here, Jacob had other wives because he, because in that, in the old time, in the ancient world, and the, their customs were if your wife, the love of your life, could not give you children, you married someone else to give you children. To be childless was an embarrassment. And so here was this man that had other wives, that had other children, and finally God hears the voice of, of his wife, the one that he loves, and God gives him a son by the name of Joseph. And so, you know, the parents were not supposed to play favoritism, but for whatever reason, Jacob did. He favored his son, Joseph, and all of his older brothers knew it. And this caused his older brothers to hate Joseph to the point where they hated him. They sold their little brother, Joseph, to some Ishmaelites. Then those little guys, those Ishmaelites took Joseph to Egypt, a foreign country, and then they sold him into slavery, and a guy bought him, and he was made their slave. And then while he was their slave in his home, he was accused of an attempted rape. Why? Because he he refused to sleep with his owner's wife. And then he was in prison for that false accusation. And then he helped two people in prison, and they were supposed to remind the Pharaoh of the goodness that Joseph had done for them. And, they, and he was forgotten. Through all of this, Joseph learned to govern himself. Joseph learned to govern himself. 
Joseph could not control what happened to him. He couldn't control the hatred his brothers had toward him. He couldn't control the fact that he was sold to Israelites. He couldn't control the fact that he was being taken to Egypt. He couldn't control the fact that he was sold into slavery. He couldn't control that this, this woman wanted to, 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 to have relationship with him. He couldn't control that he was falsely accused. He couldn't control that he was in prison. But what he could control was how he responded to what happened to him. And through it all, he was faithful to God. He remained governing himself. And though some things may not be necessarily wrong in life, because he could have made certain decisions, he chose to rule over himself. And if we're not careful, church, we can become angry and we can sin. Joseph had every reason to be upset. He had every reason to curse God. He had every reason to deny God's law. He could have done whatever felt good to him. But what did he do? He governed himself. Being angry is not a sin. Being hurt is not wrong. But being hurt or angry is no excuse for doing wrong. Let me say that again. Being angry or hurt is no excuse for doing wrong. I think that deserves a problem. Because spouses, how many times do we try to justify our bad behavior at times because we feel like we've been done wrong? Employees, how many times do we justify our bad behavior, our checking in late or taking an extra lunch or not doing all our work or not giving our 100% because we feel like we're doing wrong? Being hurt and being angry is not wrong, but it's not a justification for us to do wrong either. We must learn to govern ourselves. We must learn to rule ourselves. We are to be angry and what? Sin not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul, the Apostle Paul, while he's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's dealing with a bunch of stuff, and craziness in the Corinthian church. If you want to see a crazy church, just go to read the first, first Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians. They were crazy. They were crazy. They were doing some crazy stuff. But as he's writing to them, they begin to rebuttal and give an excuse for their lifestyle of not governing themselves. And his response to what they're saying is to say, you say, in other words, he's quoting them now, I'm allowed to do anything, or King James, everything is lawful. And then he responds by saying, but not everything is good for you. Yeah, sure. Things might be okay. They might not be against the law. They might not be a sin per se. Beating up his brother probably wouldn't have been wrong. It was part of brotherly love, right? But killing his brother, thou shalt not kill. And so here he says, I'm allowed to do anything. He's quoting them and he, says, he responds and says, not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. In other words, what he's saying is, yes, things are permissible in life. Yes, I can be hurt. Yes, I can be angry. Yes, I can feel justified. But that does not justify me doing something wrong. I must learn to govern my emotions, my thoughts, my actions. Because if I don't, sin is crouching at the door. And I'm going to do something that I'm going to regret. There have been many times I've been angry. Many times I've been upset. Many times I want to call it quits. And, I, and, I, and my, my flesh tries to get the best of me. And then I'm reminded, no, I've been given dominion to rule over this flesh. I've been given dominion to rule over the earth. I must master it. I must subdue it. I must take authority. I must take charge. No excuses. No excuses. So we can't allow anything. You should not allow anything to rule over you. 
Don't allow, don't allow things to rule over you. You're hurt. Don't let that rule over you. Because you'll walk around with hurt, but eventually it'll become bitterness. You'll walk around with anger, and it'll become hatred. You walk around with lust, and it'll become a sin. I want you to know today that we must learn and understand that we have been given dominion to govern over this earth. We've been given dominion to govern over ourselves. Pastor, it's hard. Pastor, it's impossible. Let me tell you, I'm sure that, 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 that Potiphar's wife, who was trying to sleep with Joseph, she was probably a good-looking woman. She probably could have been a dream uh, woman for any of us. But guess what? Joseph had himself governed and he said, I will not sin against Potiphar and I will not sin against God. I will govern myself and I will do what is right. I want someone to understand today that there is no excuse to do wrong. We have been given the power. We have been given the ability. We have been given the charge. We have been given the authority to walk in our dominion. So stand up today and say, I will walk in dominion. I will walk in authority. I will walk in the power that God has given me. So don't allow anything to rule you. David said, you have gave them, talking about humans, charge of everything you've made. Putting all things, everybody say all things, under their authority. We have been given authority. We've been given authority. God has told us to fill the earth. Fill this with what? With good stuff. With godly stuff. With stuff that's going to help me to govern this earth. What you put in you, you produce. You will be fruitful. You will multiply. Put junk in you, guess what? Junk in, junk out. It says, fill the earth, govern it. Paul said, and even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. I want to ask you today, will you accept the challenge? Will you walk in dominion that God has given you? Stand to our feet. Perhaps today, you may be saying, Pastor, what I'm battling is too tough. It's too tough. I can't handle it. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. As a matter of fact, think about Jesus. A man who knew no sin became sin. He knew no sin, yet he bore our shame. He was done wrong, yet he sinned not. So when you put yourself in their shoes and you think about what you're going through, it cannot be compared. A pastor, you don't know what I'm battling in my mind. You don't know what I'm battling in my life. You don't know what I'm facing. You don't know the demons that got a hold of me. Past hurts, past pains, past struggles, bitterness, anger. You don't know God. Uh, God. You don't know, Pastor. You guys don't know what I'm going through. Can I tell you a story out of Mark chapter 5? Jesus crosses, crosses over the lake. And as Jesus gets out of the boat, a man that's possessed by evil spirits comes out of the tombs to meet him. And this man, he lived in burial caves. In other words, he lived in the cemetery and could no longer be restrained. He was so far gone 
that every time they would try to chain him, they would try to get a hold of him, they would try to get him down. He couldn't. They couldn't. He was out of control. He was put in chains and shackles and often he snapped off the chains and his wrists were smashed in the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. He wasn't, he wasn't weak. He was strong, he was possessed. Day and night, he wandered among the burial caves and the hills, howling and cutting himself with sharp objects. This man was a lunatic. He was crazy. We don't know how he got there. We don't know if he was using, if he was drinking, he was traumatized. He was far from God, he rejected God. We don't know. We don't know if he was hurt, he was abused, he was mistreated. All we know that is whatever it was that got into him had now possessed him and he was crazy. Perhaps you may feel like you're there today, but you think there's no hope for me. Mark chapter five or six says this, and when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him. This demon-possessed man that would bust through chains, that would walk through the grave howling, that would cut himself, that no one could control. When this man saw Jesus, what did he do? He ran. He ran to meet Jesus. And then he bowed low before him. The man, the Bible goes on to tell us, was possessed by a legion of spirits. And they had full control over him. And when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, there was enough inside of him to run and meet Jesus and to bow before him. A legion, what does that mean? According to Roman times, that was the best soldiers in the army, and it ranged from 4,500 to 6,000 men. So when we think about the, 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 those demons that had possessed this man, you're talking about some of the strongest and toughest demons inside of this man, 4,500 to 6,000 demons that had control over this man. We don't know why, but whatever it was, he allowed them to come in. And now they had possessed him. But here he sees Jesus a distant away. And he says, I know what? I got to see him. So he drops everything. And he starts running his way to Jesus. He gets to him. He gets against the bow down low. Jesus, help me. Help me. Help me. And as he's there, Jesus sets the man free. He got to a point where he was out of control, but just a little bit of him, a little bit of that idea that God had still given him enough dominion to at least run to Jesus and to ask for help. Because he asked for help, God gave him the deliverance that he needed. Brother Mike, Brother Michael, this man, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to share a little bit of your story. I hope you don't mind. Was using meth. He had been invited to church. He came, but his mind was fogged. He knew he was already going into another place in his mind. He knew that he was, it, it was it. That, that was it. It's over. He's already gone down that path. But then, He's invited to church. He comes to church. And there's a time when they ask, does anyone here want the Holy Ghost? Does anyone here want to be set free? And Brother Mike, as he's making his way to the altar, is that correct? Making your way to the altar, you begin to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Begin to speak in other tongues. And his mind goes from foggy, goes from lost, goes far from far from God to renewed and restored 
Why? Because even in the midst of that place where you are in your mind, where you're possessed by everything evil, there's enough dominion inside of you to cry out for help, to cry out for God to help you. And God filled them with the Spirit. So we see that inside of us, church, there is enough power, enough dominion, enough authority, enough charge, even without the Holy Ghost, to overcome. It gives us at least enough to cry out. But I want you to know that what makes it even harder for the child of God to have an excuse is the fact that we have a double portion anointing. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So not only are we given dominion and authority because we were created in the image of God, we've also been given a double portion authority because we have been filled with his spirit. No excuses for the child of God. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says this, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but a power of love and of self-control. God gave us the spirit for us to control and rule and have dominion. No excuses. You have dominion. We were given dominion at creation. You received the double portion when you were filled with the Spirit of God. And so there aren't any excuses. We can try to make them up all we want. But when we come to judgment before God, they're not valid. They're not enough. Today, for someone, it may be that moment where you need to run to Jesus. You've been struggling, you've been fighting, you've been wrestling, you don't know what to do, you're losing the fight, and you think, I don't have enough power inside of me to win? I've come to tell you, you do. You do. So will you come? Will you come to this altar? Will you come and run to Jesus? Will you come to beat him? Will you come to cry out to him? Will you come and ask him for help? Will you come and ask him to give you the strength that you need so that you can overcome whatever it is that you're battling, whatever it is that's controlling you? Because that encounter, when you cry out for help, can be the very thing that will lead you to begin to walk in dominion and authority. Today, if you want to come to this altar, these altars are open. I know we may be embarrassed because we don't, we, we don't want to feel weak. We don't want to seem weak. We don't want to seem like we don't have it under control. What would have happened to that man possessed by a legion of demons? They would have said, nah, I don't, I don't want to look dumb. I don't want to look like I don't got it under control. Jesus would have showed up and would have taken off and he would have been in the same condition. But he decided, I don't care what anyone says, what anyone thinks, what I need from God is more important. Your freedom, your authority, your dominion is more important. Will you come to this altar today?